as I've been beginning to teach a series online right now through my, my beloved Truth International ministry um, teaching, I've been leading, I've been starting a, 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 a series of teachings on Joseph. And as I was teaching last week, God just spoke to me and said, Jim, why don't you do this at church? How many of us can't identify with Joseph? Right? And I really felt like God saying, Jim, the body of Christ right now, I'm going to take a break from Luke. I'll get back there after the first of the year because I want to get back to who Jesus is. But let's just take a break for the next number of weeks and look at the story of Joseph. So I'm going to invite you to turn with me to, jo to I want to call it the book of Joseph, but it's not. It's the book of Genesis, chapter 37, which is where the story of Joseph begins. So you go with me to the first book of the Bible. By the way, I, I'm not sure where I'm going to meet you guys that are doing this Thursday night class. I might be ahead of you. I might be behind you. We'll see what God's timing is for that. But as we go to Genesis chapter 37, as you turn there, I want to talk about looking back on the life of someone that you can think of and ask yourself what characterizes their life. You think back on people who've been inspirational to you. So we're talking about people who've, who've passed on, who've gone before us. And look back on their life and ask yourself, what characterizes their life? Right? I can think back, the, the one illustration that comes to mind most to me is my parents. My mom and dad, they're, they're both gone. Um, it's really funny, the, the longer they've been gone, the more I miss them. I really do. I miss them with all my heart. And I've been thinking a lot about them lately. And I thought about, you know, even though they weren't saved, even though they weren't walking with God and they were doing things that were disobedient to God, one of the things that characterizes my mom and dad's life, which has affected me, is their incredible integrity and hard work. They were hardworking. They gave me uh, a desire to want to be a hard worker. Um, and I just think back on their life and I think about my mom was a, was a woman of sacrifice. Maybe you've experienced it from your mother, or maybe as a mom, you've done it for your kids. But my mom sacrificed for her children. She, she would give up so that we could have. So I think about that, what characterizes, so you think about the people that you are thinking of right now, and you think about what was it that characterized their life. I do that to bring us into the story of Joseph to, to ask the question, what characterized Joseph's life? What characterized his life? And I wanna, what I want to bring us to, the first message that I'm going to present today, that I'm going to teach through today, is going to get us to think about Joseph's life and what characterized his life. The life of Joseph, really, if you look at Joseph's life carefully from 37 through 50, it's a series of ups and downs. By the way, can anybody relate to that series of ups and downs, right? I think God's word can, can connect with us because I think we've all been in those high places. We've all been in those low places. Joseph's life is really a life of honor, contrast with hardship. Up and down, up and down as we're going to see it. But I would contend it was all for good. So from God's perspective and Joseph's perspective, as we see Joseph responds to all that happens to him. And oftentimes when we say, what, how does Joseph respond? It's how he doesn't respond that shows who he is. Sometimes, think about that. Sometimes it's how we don't respond that really represents how we really respond in a godly way. And we're going to see that from him. So what we're going to look is, is this is kind of the theme of Joseph's life in each part of the story. So as I take us through his story in Genesis in these num next number of weeks, I want you to continue to think about this idea, right? So the first message is really an introduction to the rest of the story. And the two points I have for this morning are really symbolic or foreshadowing of what his life is going to look like as we walk through the story of Joseph. So what do we see as we begin the story of Joseph that introduces and foreshadows his life? Okay, so let's, let's read the story real quickly and then I'll walk us through it. Chapter 37 in, in, in uh, Genesis verses 1 through 11. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a varied colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream. When, when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he still had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his, brother, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Not a great way to start the story of Joseph, right? And we're going to see that. So what I want us to see in the first number of, I'll, I'll give you the two points. The two points are actually in the bulletin. So if you have the bulletin in front of you, the two points are there that I'm going to walk us through this morning. First of all is Joseph's predicament. Joseph starts in a predicament, and his predicament, as I see from the text, is his father's favoritism for him, which leads to his hardship, right? And then secondly, we see Joseph's prediction, those are the dreams I'm going to bring us to in a minute, his favor by God, which leads to his honor. We're going to see how the dreams are going to point to something later on. So let's start in 37. So, so we've got the story they live in the land of Canaan, which God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they live in that land. They're now settled in that land. And these are the records of Jacob. And Jacob's records don't start with other people. They start with Joseph. God purposefully, and, you, and you're going to see in a minute, well, why didn't start with Reuben? Because Reuben's the firstborn, right? Reuben should have the place of honor. But he starts with Joseph for a reason. And this is the inspired word of God. Now, what I want us to see in the text, if you see it, Joseph is how old? He's 17 years of age, right? And it tells us while he's still a youth. I don't know about you, but when I hear 17 years of age, immediately it brings me to an individual, which right here would be my daughter. My daughter is 17, soon to be 18. So when I hear the scriptures say that Joseph was that, immediately I can put myself in the, in the frame, mind of, he was a youth, just like Zoe. Gage, you're 16, right? So I, 17, so you're 17 as well. So think, about, so think about Gage, 17, that would have been the age of Joseph. Because oftentimes we think Joseph was older as the story begins. He's not. He's 17. But we're going to highlight I want to highlight for you how incredible that is in, in the story of Joseph. So, so they're, they're, they're pasturing the flock, so we know what his family does for a living, right? They're shepherds, and that's going to come into the story later on when they get to Egypt, right? So they're out, and the, they're, they're doing that, and we, he tells us that he's out, he's, he's along with his brothers, the sons of Billa and Zilpah, and I'll bring those up in a minute, We'll go back to this. But what I want us to show in Joseph's predicament is I want to see from the text the three things, the three reasons why the brothers hated Joseph and were jealous of him. Okay? So let's look at the text. First of all, if you look in those, um, the, the second verse, and it says, And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So Joseph's out in the field pasturing with his brothers, and he comes back to his dad and gives a bad report about the brothers. Now, some people could say, well, he's tattling, right? How many of you kids in here have been told by your parents, don't tattle, right? How about, Colton, how about older people in the congregation? How many of you ever heard that from your parents, even though they're long gone? No tattling, right? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in a minute, Joseph, I don't believe Joseph was tattling. I don't believe Joseph was talented. As a matter of fact, I think, I think Jacob, because we're what we're going to see is the character in, in the book of Genesis, the contrast between Joseph's character and the brother's character. There's a reason why I think daddy sent Joseph out 
to watch their behavior because there's something not so good about the brothers. And maybe, I think, I would contend that Jacob actually sent Joseph out to keep tabs on him so that he could report back to daddy. Which, by the way, I'm going to say this up front, puts Joseph in a very precarious situation. Not good. But that's the way it was, okay? So watch this. He brings back a, a, a bad report, right? Now you could say, well, this is, this is, he's tattling on that. But no, I'm going to contend that it was a bad report. He was simply reporting what his father had asked him to do. All right? And I'm convinced that we're going to see from the beginning that Joseph is faithful. One of the character qualities we're going to see, not only here, but as we go through the story, Joseph is faithful, right? And we begin to see his character here, and we're going to see their character to begin to develop, and we're going to see who the bad, bad ones really are. It's not Joseph, okay? All right. So he brings back a bad report. Um, but let me just say this. Even though that might be the, the, the reason why he did what he did, and it was pure motives, it still doesn't make him popular with his brothers to begin with. Like I said, that puts him in a really, really, really sticky situation with his brothers, especially if there's already feelings about him in the first place, which we're going to find out in a minute, okay? So watch, continue on, verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. You've got to know that's not going to be troublesome at all, right? He loved his Joseph more than all his son. Why? Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. So second, the second reason why they don't like him, why the story is going to unfold the way it does, starting in the, in the next section that we're going to look at in two weeks, was he loved him more than, he was showing favoritism. He was his favorite. He was the son of his old age. He was, if you know the story, and we're going to look at it in a minute, in Genesis 35, we're going to see the lineage in a minute, and we're going to see that Joseph was the firstborn by Rachel. He wasn't the youngest. Benjamin would have been the youngest. Joseph was the oldest. So I'm convinced from the text that the reason why Joseph was his favorite is because he was the firstborn of Rachel. And if you look at the story, he had children by Rachel. We're going to see in a minute he had six by Rachel. But he didn't really want Rachel. He wanted Leah. If you go back in the story, he got tricked by Laban into marrying Leah. He didn't really want her. He was married to her, but he really wanted Rachel. So what we're seeing is part of Jacob's heart here was that because she reminds him, he reminds her of Rachel as the firstborn, which he had longed for, that's going to cause his favoritism toward Joseph. All right? So, building. Building. He brings back a bad report. He's his favorite. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. This is interesting. It says, and they saw, they saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers. Now, what would be the visual reminder? What he was wearing. Have you ever seen that in the story? As he continued to wear this multicolored tunic, it would be in your face as a constant reminder, your daddy's favorite. I'm glad that stuff doesn't bother us at all, right? We don't get bothered by those constant reminders of things like that, right? And it's interesting, because of that, it says, and they, would, they could not speak to him on friendly terms. In 1 Samuel 25, 6, you can write this down. I'm not going to take you there, but 1 Samuel 25, 6, it talks about going to, I think it's David talking about going to a group of people and saying to them, show your favored greeting to them. And the favored greeting, by the way, do you know how people in, in Israel greet each other and say goodbye with the same word, shalom. It's peace, right? And it's the idea of a favored greeting, right? And what this shows is the fact that they would not show the, the customary favored greeting to him, peace be with you and extended to you. It was like a, you know, it's like greeting somebody. Barbara, it's like greeting you and saying peace to you and may God bless you. May God bless you. Well, because of what's going on, they're not going to do that. They refuse to do that. And what it shows here is a broken relationship. There's no reconciliation between the brothers. It's already started off bad, and it's going to get worse. That's the second reason 
why they couldn't speak. Now let me just go back real quickly and show you the brothers. So if you go back in Genesis 35, 23 to 36, I'm not going to read it, but I'll show you back in 35, previous to this in two chapters, what we see is we see the, the, the lineage of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And 23 to thir through 26, it basically tells us that, that he had six children, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, Zebulun, by Leah. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Then by the sons of Billah, Rachel's, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. Now watch this. You go back to the text and you say, well, that's a contradiction to the text in Genesis 37. No, it's not. It talks about them being his wives. They were his handmaids, but in Jewish context, they still would have been his wives. So he had four wives instead of two. Okay? Two of them, Billa and Zilpah, would have been the children by handmaids, kind of like almost second class citizens, as opposed to his other brothers. Right? So we see that going on. So add to this bad report of his, his, in his faithfulness, the favoritism, the son of his old age, it's going to make things worse. Now watch this. So he gives him, to show the favoritism, he gives him this multicolored tunic. Not only is it an ongoing reminder of his favoritism, but how many of you know what they wore in those days? They were pretty bland tunics. This one was multicolored, which implies it was given to royalty. So by, Joseph, by Jacob giving Joseph this, he's really saying, you're the royal one. Oh, ouch, sting, that hurts, right? So you consider that all into play, and you can see the hatred building for that. Now watch this. The third reason why they're going to hate him even more and become jealous of him is it says Joseph has a dream, right? So he has two dreams. The first one in verse 5, he told it to them. And it says his brothers hated him even more. Well, what was the dream? This is interesting. The dream was symbolic, and it was like, okay, here's your sheaves, here's my sheaf in the field. Uh, yours are going to bow down to me. Okay, now watch this. Do we know if the the, the brothers understood the meaning of the dream. They did because they said they hated him even more. You're not going to hate somebody even more if you're clueless as to the meaning of the dream. They would have understood in their culture what that meant. That means that we're going to bow down. And how do we know even from the text? They even say, so you think you're going to rule over us? Now think about this. Why would they say that? He is the next to the last born. Right? So he's 11 of 12. Reuben would have been the firstborn, and then Judah, and then beyond that. Now, think about it even in your own life. If your sibling, who was maybe 10, 15 years you know, old, younger than you, came to you and said, Oh, by the way, <laughs> I'm mommy and daddy's favorite, and I get to do whatever mommy and daddy tell me I can do, and you're going to have to, oh, wouldn't this be a killer? Mommy and daddy put me in charge when they're gone. Oh, no. Can you see the relationship here? Can you see the application? Daddy's putting the next to the youngest in charge. Oh, boy, that's got a sting. And none of us can relate to that at all, right? Have you ever had conflict with your older siblings because you were a favorite? I, I'll just share this real quickly. Growing up, well, when I got older, probably into my 30s, um, all my siblings said to me one day, you know you were mom's favorite, right? No, I was never mom's favorite. No, you were mom's favorite. No, I was never, yeah, you know, I, maybe I was mom's favorite. And I wonder if some of that conflict growing up with them didn't have to do with the fact that they saw me as mommy's favorite. I mean, this is real stuff. This is the kind of stuff that can cause all kinds of relationship issues, even within a family, okay? So, so they relate that first dream, right? And we know what the dream was. And look at, look at the response. Really, are you going to 
rule over us? Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you going to rule over us? So it says what? In verse 8, they hated him even more for his dreams. Can you see the hate growing? The hate is just absolutely growing. There's three reasons right now. Now watch this. He gives a second dream, right? And the dream was the one about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay? Now he's brought in. Do you know who the sun and the moon would have represented? And we know that Jacob understood it by the way he responds. The sun and the moon in that culture would have represented the mother and father. That's interesting. So Jacob says back to him, uh, you're my favorite, but chill out. That's kind of the, the modern paraphrase, kind of chill out. Do you really think that not only are your siblings going to bow down to you, but do you think mom and I are going to bow down to you too? Now, it's interesting. At this point in the story, if you go back to Genesis 35, Rachel is already dead. She's been dead for a number of years. She actually, if you go back and look at the story, uh, right before the scripture I gave you, 23 to 26, you go back 16 through 19, it tells us that she died on her way to Bethlehem of Ephrathah, giving birth and childbirth to Benjamin. Actually, she named him Benoni, right before she died, which means, I believe it means son of my sorrow. Because she knew that her youngest, she was going to die after giving birth to her youngest, Benjamin. And then later, Jacob goes and renames him Benjamin. Okay? Interesting. So Rachel's already dead. So who in the world could he be talking about here? Stepmom. Probably Leah. Probably Leah. Which, who knows what his relationship was, was like with, with his stepmom. But he's been living under her care since Rachel died when Benjamin was, was born. And Benjamin probably at this point in time, um, roughly, is probably about 10 years younger than him. So he's a little guy still at this point, right? Now watch this. This is interesting. Um, he says to him, I love what he says to him, right, in verse 11. It says his brothers were jealous of him. So now we've gone from hatred, hatred, hatred to jealousy. But look at the contrast in verse 11. But his father kept the saying in mind. Now, why is that significant? Why would his father keep the saying in mind? Who had had dreams earlier? Jacob. Jacob. If anybody would understand Joseph's dream, it would be Jacob because Jacob had had previous dreams. And I'll give you a couple of scriptures that you can look at. Genesis 28, 12. And Genesis 31, 11, I don't know which one is which, but one of them, one of them was about Jacob's ladder. You remember that? The vision of the angels going up and down the ladder. So Jacob, of all people, that's why I don't think he, he rebukes him, but he keeps it in mind. He keeps that saying in mind because in the back of his mind, he's probably thinking to himself, I don't understand the dream. It doesn't make sense. But he's probably, he can't prove it from the text, but he's probably thinking, just like the dream that came to me were from God, this is probably from God as well. In which we're going to see these dreams really were from God. And they were for good, not for bad. They weren't meant to hurt anybody. They were all for good. Now one of the things uh, that I want to contend in this text this morning, based on the character of Joseph here and the character of Joseph throughout the story, some people will say, well, he said this in pride. That he was arrogant. Now, here's the thing. We, can't, we don't know the tone of voice in Scripture. That's hard. We can't, we can't tell that. But based on the context of here and the context later on, I do not believe that he said this in pride. He was simply being a vessel for God, relaying a message from God to his brothers, which they didn't accept. Right? So this is interesting. Now, watch this. This is really, really, here he goes. Watch this. Zoe jokes about how I use that phrase, watch this, because then it's, it means something's coming, right? If you look at Numbers 12, 6, I'm going to take you to a couple of cross-references really quickly. Numbers 12, 6, and you can, just, you can just write it down. You don't have to necessarily turn there. But in Numbers 12, 6, it says this, speaking to Aaron and Miriam. He said, this is God. 
Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Catch that? If there's a prophet among you, this is what he's going to do. And then in Amos 3, 7, basically the Lord says this. I do nothing. I don't act before I ever tell my prophets beforehand what I'm going to do. So if he's giving him dreams and visions, and these are from God, what is he just called, in essence, what is God calling Joseph? A prophet. How many of you have ever seen Joseph as a prophet? He is. According to Scripture, he's a prophet. I, I love that. It's so absolutely wonderful. Okay? All right. And what's interesting in all of this is although Reuben was his firstborn, and should have received the birthright, Joseph, in a sense, gets daddy's birthright by being the favorite, and he would have understood it because Jacob received Esau's birthright from Isaac. You see in the connections in the story between Jacob and Joseph, it's absolutely amazing, right? Okay. All right. So, this is the message that's going to set up what's coming. Did you see it already? The favoritism, which is going to lead to hardship. We're going to see times in the story of Joseph where he, he starts to rise up and he starts to get favored, and then we see him fall into hardship. That's going to be a pattern of his life. But you're also going to see him go from the hardship to rise up and be favored by God. That's what I want us to see in this story of Joseph. And I hope you're excited about going in this story with me, this story of Joseph. It's such a beautiful story. I would encourage you to go read it, go back and look at what I talked about today, and just think about this. Okay, now watch this. Both Joseph's treatment by his father and God, an early part of his life point to that, what I just talked about. That's what characterizes Joseph's life was both a life of honor and a life of hardship. And I'm here to tell you, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you think your life is going to be any different, it's not. You will find times in your life where God will favor you and honor you, and oftentimes it's that honoring and the favoring that causes people to get upset, to be jealous of us, and come after us. Right? And you see that all over Scripture. So my question for us today is, what characterizes your life? What characterizes your life? Have you thought about it? Most of us don't think about that. You know, I was thinking the other day about the day the Lord might take me home. I don't know when that's going to be. I mean, it could be this afternoon. It could be 25 years from now. None of us know. And I think to myself, what do my, my life to be characterized by? What do I want to be known by? What do I want people to say about me? And, and, and in essence, this is what I would want it to be. I want people to say about Jim Garnett that he was a guy, he was a faithful man of God, even though he screwed up and sinned and made mistakes. But what characterized his life was he loved the Lord Jesus Christ and he pointed people to Jesus to give him glory and help them through his word to know God better. Think about that today, the practical application. What characterizes your life? What do you want to be known by when your day comes? And here's, I'm going, to sh I'm going to close on this. His favoritism, has favoritism affected your life and brought hardship? Is your life being favored by God leading to honor? Let me say this as I close out. Favoritism by the Father is take it out on Joseph. Think about that with me for a minute. Who should they have been angry with? Jacob. You, heard, you ever heard the phrase, kicking the dog? You ever had somebody do something to you and you felt like you couldn't do anything in retaliation return, so you took it out on something else, like kicking the dog? That's what's going on here. They should be angry with their father because their father was the one that had him go and give the bad report. His father was the one that showed favoritism. Father had nothing to do with the dreams, but they should be angry. But instead, they take it out on Joseph. And the question I want to ask us as we get ready to go through the rest of the story of Joseph was, is there anything in Scripture in Joseph's life that would have deserved the kind of treatment 
that he received here and will receive later by others. He was a blameless man. Think about Job. Did Job do anything? Even though he wasn't sinless, he was blameless, had a consistent walk with the Lord. Did he do anything to deserve it? No. Sometimes it's a life of hardship by the way we live, and sometimes it's just God's hand working in our lives, right? And what a perfect segue, thinking about Jesus, right? Thinking about Jesus. Did Jesus deserve anything in terms of what he got? I'm telling you, if anybody in this life didn't deserve to be treated the way he was treated, it would be our Lord Jesus Christ. He did nothing. But I remember saying this. I remember talking about this kind of paradox to my students one day as we were talking about the holy season a couple of years ago. And I remember he shouldn't have suffered because he was innocent. But because he was innocent, he's the only one that could suffer. Because he was innocent, he was the only one that could suffer and die for us. Isn't that an interesting paradox? He didn't deserve it. We deserved what he got. But because he was innocent, he would be the only one that could take our place on the cross. Brothers and sisters, as I go to the scripture here in a minute, I want you to think about how much time you and I put into thinking about what these elements represent this morning. How often do we remember what Jesus has done for us, not only in the past on the cross, but what he continues to do in our lives to sanctify us and make us more like Jesus? How often do we honestly stop and remember those things? We don't, do we? So, we're going to sing a song. We're, I'm still with you. I haven't jumped ahead of you. The Holy Spirit just, I was going to. The Holy Spirit just brought me back. <laughs> We're going to sing a song to think about, not just now, but every day of our life. Do we remember what Jesus has done for us on